economics of publishing have always been baffling, but never more so than in the late 1980s, when unknown writers frequently found themselves the recipients of stonking great advances. There are all sorts of reasons, most of which boil down to a heady combination of madness and hubris. But one explanation makes sense. Huge advances got people talking. Spending $100,000 on an author was still cheaper than paying an equivalent amount for marketing, with the bonus of making people desperate to know what all the fuss was about. Michael Chabin's The Mysteries of Pittsburgh is a case in point. Writing in the LA Times, Richard Rayner recalled seeing the book's first chapter spooling from the fax machine at Granta magazine in 1988. Somebody had sent us the first chapter of Pittsburgh, which, we soon learned, had just sold for a phenomenal amount of money in New York. Naturally, seeing ourselves as literary tastemakers and not slavish followers of hype, we all wanted to hate it. Even today, almost 30 years after Shabon pocketed his $155,000 advance, I was ghoulishly curious when I started reading. How could anyone know, on the basis of the mysteries of Pittsburgh alone, that Shabon would have such an impressive career? Why did he get all this money for a novel when so many other promising debut novelists got far less, or didn't get deals at all to put things at their most cynical? Shabon had the advantage of good looks and good timing. He was handsome, young and arrived on the book scene just as hype about the literary brat pack was reaching its height. Publishers were casting around for the new thing, and there he was. Better still, his book was full of young and handsome people having lusty and unusual sex, with some gangsters right out of the Wise Guys and Goodfellas era to boot. Novelist Michael Chabon earlier in 2017 photographed Sarah Lee for The Guardian on that basis, Scepter might as well have spent its dollars on, say, Rick Astley and had a sexy gangster book ghost written for him. But something about the mysteries of Pittsburgh defeats cynicism. In a New York Times review, Alice McDermott wrote there is the pleasure of a fresh voice and a keen eye, of watching a writer clearly in love with language and literature, youth and wit, expound and embellish upon the world as he sees it, Chabin's talent bursts from the pages. For instance, he is very good at describing inebriation I had drunk very much very quickly, art, the narrator tells us, and wasnt following the action of the film too well. Everything seemed impossibly fast and noisy. There are intriguing jokes I admit I have an ugly fondness for generalizations, so perhaps I may be forgiven when I declare that there is always something weird about a girl that majors in French. And there are some excellent character portraits, such as that of Jane, who is introduced to readers thwacking golf balls across the neighborhood at a house party, smelling interestingly of light exertion, beer, perfume and cut grass. Chabon is also good at writing about the business of literature. There are amusing descriptions of working in a shop whose owners think a good book was still a plump little paperback that knew how to sit in a beach bag and keep its dirty mouth shut. The novel is full of knowing, fond references to literary culture and writers, including a cheeky nod at Homer and a description of sea dark Spanish wine. It would be easy to say that. This excellent material foreshadows future Chabon classics, including The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier in Clay and The Yiddish Policeman's Union. But this novel is far from perfect. As McDermott pointed out, The Mysteries of Pittsburgh contains plenty of the disappointments, inherent in any early work of serious fiction. Chabon is great at describing his characters, but not at keeping them in focus. After her marvelous entrance, Jane barely gets a look in apart from a brief scene where she makes a salad. Art's female love interest, Flox, receives a lot of impressive physical description, but we never really see inside her. Likewise, Art's gangster father seems more colorful offstage, becoming curiously flat when he actually appears. There are also odd plot points. IDIDNT buy into a dual fencing narrative that appears in the last third of the book, and there are curious loose ends. Early on, we are told Arts kept copies of the local newspaper from his dad the day after his mother's funeral, and there are a few big hints suggesting funny business around her death, but they are never properly explored. Such frustrations, however, are easily forgiven, because the other thing that this book has is charm, and an endearing quality common to all of Chabon's novels. You can help but like it, in spite of its faults. Rayner recalled that as those faxed pages went around, passed from hand to hand like candy as some drug, the staff at Granta realized they couldn't hate it after all the writing was just so elegant and gorgeous and daring.